So, um, who's got a question? This gentleman here. I just wondered if uh, Cynthia would care to elaborate on the Tupac uh, murder. Um, one of the things that uh, I found in the popular press was that Tupac had been um, uh, his, he was suffering from uh, death threats. The interesting thing was that the hip hop community had become uh, saddled with this problem that was conceived as an East Coast, West Coast problem. And if one does a careful reading of the counterintelligence program papers, the COINTELPRO papers of the FBI, what one sees is that this was the exact strategy that was utilized by the FBI against the Black Panther Party. And so you had this East Coast, West Coast thing that veritably destroyed the Black Panther Party, but it was all concocted and carried out by the FBI. This is all in their paperwork. Well, it was interesting to me that at least one of the organizations that was shaking Tupac down was one of the organizations that was used by the FBI to disrupt the activities of the Black Panther Party. And it is also a fact that many of um, our hip hop artists today are under surveillance and they are under surveillance and we know that from the New York Times articles and uh, Miami Herald articles that have uh, talked about the creation of these special units that track the goings on of the hip hop uh, singers. Now, I find that very interesting because I've also done a bit of, uh, well, I just brought together some resources of people who were in the music industry and wondered, I wondered if the counterintelligence program targeted political icons, would the counterintelligence program also target uh, political cultural icons? And if we look at, for example, Paul Robeson, or John Lennon. that's right, John Lennon, uh, uh, Bob Marley, uh, Jimi Hendrix, um, and of course, I've spoken with Paul Robeson's son, uh, spoken with Tupac Shakur's mother. Um, Alex Constantine has written a book about Jimi Hendrix and his uh, pro uh, Black Panther leanings. He, he, but he, are you suggesting that Hendrix uh, was murdered? Or Marley had cancer of the foot, didn't he? And didn't, didn't Hendrix take a drug overdose? Um, or I maybe he didn't, the, I mean. Well, I think, I think the point is that the cultural, the cultural icons have the ability to make some substantive impact on the political process. And these cultural icons, for example, Jimi Hendrix can attract millions of people. Um, uh, Tupac Shakur can attract millions of people. So therefore, uh, you want to, um, uh, how can I say, um, um, they have the ability to persuade people far more easily because they um, uh, have the ability to attract, pe to attract people. That's sort of um, the... Um, cultural icons and and uh, that sort of thing. Mm, okay, but I'm I mean I'm curious as to whether you think that Hendrix was murdered and 
Marley was murdered, for instance. I mean, it's clear, obviously, Chapman killed Lennon. I mean, that's a fact, obviously. Mm. Well, uh, with respect to Marley, I think, um, the, I, I think there is enough question um, and the visit, the supposed visit by the son of the CIA, um, son of the CIA chief, I think that is a part of the history of the whole Marley targeting. All right, well, that's, that's fascinating. Have we got any more questions? Hi, Cynthia. Um, yes. During the conference, um, you mentioned the uh, prospects of possibly having George Bush and uh, Tony Blair um, having their date in court um, in another country. Um, could you just kind of like explain that process and how that might take place so we have a better understanding of what might take, you know, how it would develop? First of all, it was the uh, Malaysia Peace Organization that uh, came together under the leadership of Tun Dr. Mahathir, former Prime Minister of Malaysia. And uh, Dr. Mahathir has uh, formed this organization called uh, Criminalized War. So basically what um, his objective is in terms of this organization is to pursue the criminalization of war and to hold leaders accountable if they send uh, their, uh, if they cause their country to become engaged in war. Now, uh, what we did was we looked at uh, Iraq and later on uh, we looked at uh, Abu Ghraib, we looked at Guantanamo Bay, and there were clear victims. And so then about three weeks ago or so, we um, uh, looked at these uh, victims and we heard testimony from them. The testimony was from people who had been tortured, people who had been put away in Guantanamo Bay, um, people whose relatives had been killed. And rendition, did you deal with that? Yes. Extraordinary rendition. Yes, yes. And um, so, um, because these activities took place and the testimony was received. The testimony was then turned over to a panel of internationally acclaimed uh, jurists and eventually they uh, decided that um, through their deliberations that Bush and uh, Blair could be uh, tried for torture, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. We just decided that um, hmm, maybe two weeks ago. This is, this is through some action in the Spanish courts, is it? Uh, that's the other action that we're dealing with, but this is uh, through the action of the Malaysia Tribunal. So this would be in Malaysia? In Malaysia, yes. Okay. I mean, I've interviewed um, people, well, particularly one chap called Chris Coverdale, who's been trying to go to the police stations in this country and bring war crimes charges against, uh, well, the British government, effectively, you know, Blair, yes. Brown, everybody. And, um, and he's, you know, he says that we are signatories to um, legal, ag legally binding agreements that make uh, the kind of war that we've been conducting illegal that yes. are part of our law and yet he cannot get those things past the initial phase they just disappear they don't get dealt with you know so how That's right. how do you think I mean if these are uh, um, crimes of, of war you know um, and genocide 
how can we take it to the next stage if everybody's acting in concert to stop that happening? Well, um, I think we have to take action upon ourselves. If the state of circumstances is unjust, then we have to figure out a way to work ourselves toward justice. And if we can't find justice in the national courts or the international courts, then we have to take it upon ourselves as Splitting the Sky did, was a Native American you mentioned him. who tried to serve a, an arrest warrant on George Bush. And so now he's, gonna, he's got his day in court in March of next year. And, and this is in Canada, isn't this it? This is in Canada, yes. And so uh, we're going, I hope, I've been asked by Splitting the Sky to testify. And if, to, if asked, I will go to Canada and testify about what I know about George W. Bush and the criminality of the Bush administration. Wow. Well, yeah, I think somebody wanted to hear a book. <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for one more question. This lady here. Songs from the Soul Missing Trillions, where did they come from and where did they go? And were there any public statements? Well, there was one public statement uh, where Donald Rumsfeld acknowledged that um, the 2.3 trillion was missing. But remember, when something is missing, it's not like it just, you know, swoops up in the air or whatever. It um, means that somebody got it. And the question is, who got the 2.3 trillion? We know where they came from. They came from the taxpayers. It's uh, public money, um, but it is being treated as if it's some private coffer. It's an unimaginably large sum of money, isn't it? I can't imagine it. No, and, and yet, of course, he declared it on, de on December the 10th, 2001. Sorry, September the 10th, 2001. And, uh, and that was it. You know, the next day it was wiped out, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, um, do you think he... Well, I know you think he knew, so... About September 11th. About September 11th. You know, you can't really say anything about George W. Bush about knowing anything because, you know, anyone, I would never say that this man knew anything because he's just kind of out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so is your, take, is your take on George W. Bush then that he is just a puppet and not a very intelligent one? And, and maybe there are other puppets perhaps who are more intelligent. You know, maybe Obama is a bit more intelligent. Than, than Bush, but he's still a puppet. Is, do you think that's a take that's got some resonance? Well, I just like puppet, you know? Um, and anyone who would choose to be a puppet, in my opinion, can't be, you know, too bright. Because ultimately it's about, what we are about is self-determination. And um, the antithesis of that is having somebody tell you what to do and what you can't do and who you, where you got to be and who, you can, who your identity is and all of that. And so, um, you know, I don't want to give them any credit at all. No, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm turning yeah, up my yeah, mouth. You, yeah, you, you were. <laughs> I'm turning up my mouth. You were doing that. Well, this brings me to another question then, because a lot of people have said, for instance, that uh, the people, the puppet masters, if you like, of Obama have got the information on him. And it might include, and I'm not saying any of this is true, it might include that he's not a natural-born citizen and therefore ineligible to be president of the United States that he's a naturalized Indonesian and therefore not eligible to be a president of the United States, that he's been caught having sex with a man and snorting cocaine in a private car in Washington, D.C., and that probably makes him eligible to become president of the United States. <laughs> 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 and I don't know if any of those things are true. However, um, that does bring me to a question. If they've got the dirt on the guy um, and that's how they're controlling him, 
um, or maybe ideologically he agrees with it and he wants to be a puppet, um, have they tried to make you their puppet? Have they s 